So this is our uh, spiritual practice video for today. And the, the, the spiritual practice that I want to talk about today uh, is it was expressed by Sir John Templeton in, in a phrase, uh, really a, a unique phrase. He refers, he speaks about what he calls the crowding out technique. The crowding out technique. Um, and so an example that he gives of the crowding out technique is, uh, is this, he says, and he says, try not to think of bananas. Well, probably if I tell you don't think of bananas, well, of course you're going to think of a banana or bananas. And so how can you, how can you uh, obey that injunction, don't think of bananas? Well, you can think of oranges. So whenever I say don't think of bananas, you immediately think of an orange, and then you're thinking of oranges instead of bananas. <laughs> that sounds like a comedy skit, a comedy routine. But actually, it's quite serious, the, quite, the crowding out technique. And it's actually Sir John's way of expressing an ancient principle of, as, of asceticism. Oh, asceticism, what is that? Um, well, asceticism is a word that, uh, that um, uh, com it comes from Greek, and it refers to the training of athletes, athletic training, going to the gym, if you will. That takes a little bit of discipline, and it takes hard work. Uh, uh, you may go into the gym feeling tired. You come out feeling invigorated. Yes, so there's a definite payoff to it, but it can still take some motivation to get oneself to go. Well, asceticism in the spiritual life is sort of like a spiritual workout. If we find that we're not able to still our minds or quiet our minds or to focus upon the deeper things of life, it's probably because our minds are filled with something else. And so the crowding out technique is a, an ascetical trick of changing the subject, just changing, changing the subject. Um, and let's say, for instance, that there was a desire to have some chocolate. Now, chocolate's a pretty innocuous uh, addiction to have, so it's pretty easy to talk about having a chocolate addiction, I guess. Maybe not for everyone, but for, oh, for in, in some cases. So let's say that... Um, that you, the impulse or the desire to have chocolate comes along. Well, a simple ascetical response to that is just change the subject. So you're thinking about chocolate, but then you go over and, and, and do something uh, else in, in your house, or maybe go to the garage or go upstairs, do what needs to be done. And what happens is that you actually forget about the chocolate. And you might not think about the chocolate till an, till an hour later, and then you think, oh, I don't need that chocolate now. That's the crowding out technique. Um, and uh, asceticism is foundational to the spiritual life because it's that training whereby we start to control our impulses and we start to control our desires. We start to overcome addiction, say, to anger or to greed or to hatred, uh, what to speak of actually more, more, more physical uh, addictions. This is essential to the spiritual life. There really can't be a spiritual life that of any real significance when someone's mind is filled with hatred or anger. It's like hatred and anger, uh, greed too, um, these strong emotions, when they're present, it's as if they actually counteract or negate a spiritual consciousness or a spiritual awareness. And so every spiritual tradition of any significance is grounded upon the cultivation of ascetical practices that can bring about an ethical purification, a kind of moral cleansing that allows us to experience that inner quietness of conscience in which we can begin in that basic mind of clarity and goodness where the spiritual intuitions begin to become more apparent to our conscious minds. It's a natural process. Uh, sometimes words like morality and asceticism in a spiritual context can trigger for some people who had maybe authoritarian religious upbringings, um, um, responses that really don't have to be there. They're not necessarily part of the spiritual life, but one has to be gentle with oneself. So. Um, the language can sound a little bit uh, like going to the gym, but the basic, it's almost mechanical. If we want to experience those deeper ranges of the spiritual life, then we have to, well, we don't have to think about bananas. Uh, and we, what we can do is we can follow the advice of an ancient Greek uh, desert father, as he is thought of, uh, Evagrius Ponticus, who spoke of driving out a nail with a nail. 
And if anybody's ever um, had a problem with the, you're working with a piece of wood and the nail head from an old nail is broken, well, you can use another nail, perhaps from the other side, to, to knock that nail out. And so crowding out technique is the driving out of a nail with another nail. That goes back to, the, to an ancient Greek, a Christian, uh, um, a monastic, and ascetic, Evagrius Ponticus. But Evagrius Ponticus, although he was Christian, uh, and he was, of course, later suspected of heresy, uh, he himself was drawing upon an ancient tradition of asceticism in, in the Greek uh, and Roman religious traditions. But not only that, it's also possible there was some influence, perhaps, of Buddhism and certainly, clearly, some influence of the yoga traditions of India as a result of Alexander the Great's expeditions um, in, uh, in Alexandria and in the Greco-Roman world of the second, third, and fourth centuries. And so um, that then can lead us to ask, what do Hinduism and Buddhism and other religious traditions have to say about this? Well, um, in the Yoga Sutra, uh, a tech, the, the text that is the sort of manual of meditative yoga practices, it tells us there uh, to uh, cultivate counteracting thoughts. The, the Sanskrit expression is pratipaksha bhavana, or the cultivation of counteracting thoughts. Uh, as it says in the Yoga Sutra, uh, using the Bryant translation, when being harassed by negative thoughts, one should cultivate counteracting thoughts. So again, this is, this is the idea of, um, that we find in Sir John of, uh, of the crowding out technique. If we're having a problem about thinking about bananas, just start thinking about oranges. That's the, that's the basic idea. So, so practically, how would that work? All right, well, so that was the setup. Sometimes as a professor, I talk too much when we should be working on meditation. But let me just say this then. We have a minute or so to, to left. Let us try, or you can do this later, to try to find a meditative uh, state of mind. Let us try to quiet our minds. Let us become inwardly still. And now, if you will, let's take a selfie of our mental state. Don't take the selfie with a real smartphone. Use your mental smartphone and take a selfie of your mental state right now. When I say it, then you can do it. Okay, take a, take a mental selfie. All right, now, what do you see? Let's freeze frame it to use older language. What do you see? Let's do it again, take it again. What do you see? What's the dominant theme? What are the, what are the major threads running through your consciousness right now? Uh, perhaps boredom, perhaps interest, maybe something stronger. Maybe there's a bit of resentment. Maybe there's a bit of anger. Maybe there's some hatred, hope, maybe not. Maybe there's some fear. Maybe there's some anxiety. Take it again and start to see what the trend line is. So these uh, stronger passions and moods, these, these can obscure our, our, our natural brightness, the brightness of our minds when it's, they're not obscured and, and filtered by wants and, and dislikes and, and other such, such um, distorting factors. So, Let's do that. Let's take the trend line. We can keep taking a couple of selfies and see what the dominant, what some of the dominant um, uh, moods or, or emotional states are. So let's just say that there is a feeling of, of, uh, of resentment. Perhaps there's a, a little bit of resentment uh, at the back of the mind that actually colors your day. Actually, resentment can make your day feel kind of limited and narrow. You can perhaps start to feel that your potential would be fulfilled if only this or that person were different. Resentment. So the crowding out technique, the countervailing thought of the Yoga Sutra, Evagrius is driving out the nail with another nail, uh, the Dalai Lama recommends similar practices. We can find them in, 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 in the, the scriptures and the, the ascetical writings of Judaism, Islam as well, is to cultivate the opposite thought. Now, it doesn't mean you have to go out and start hugging the people that you may feel these negative emotions towards. Sometimes it's not even advisable, actually. We're not really interested right now in the other 
people. We're interested in, your, in our own mental state, our own ability to go deeper. So mentally, at least, we could perhaps embrace the person that we're feeling this toward. It doesn't mean we have to do it externally. It might not even be appropriate to do that. But we have to release that emotion from ourselves so that we can then go into this deeper state of, of calmness and clarity. So at the very least, we can stop resenting if we're feeling resentment. If we're feeling some anger, we can cultivate, if not love, we can cultivate equalness of mind, equanimity towards that person. And again, I, I caution, I say, it's not necessary to go and actually find people to do this with. In some cases, it's just not appropriate. Okay, that's the driving, that's the crowding out technique.